Hey, everyone. Can you guys hear me well? Awesome. And so uh, I'm so stoked to be here with you guys today in my culture. So I am Yoruba, which is an ethnic group in the western part of Nigeria. And it's customary that when you see someone or a group of people, you have to greet them appropriately. And so the tricky thing about this is that in Yoruba, there's not a single way to say hello or to give a greeting. So it completely depends on the context in which you meet the person. Are they eating? Are they working? Have they, have they been lazy all day? And so I knew I was coming to speak with you guys, and I was trying to figure out the best way to greet you guys as I'm the last talk of the day. And so you guys have been sitting here listening to all our amazing speakers. And I realized that in Yoruba, which is a perfect language, there's literally a perfect greeting for this. And so I greet you with ekujoko, which literally translates to, hello, you people who have been sitting here for hours. Oh, but I'm not done. Um, I couldn't come here today and represent my people without having you guys speak some Yoruba. So let's practice. It's really easy. So turn to the person next to you and be inclusive. So if someone doesn't have someone, speak to them too. Um, and so let's turn to the person next to you and say, eh, ku, joko. Oh my goodness, you guys are fluent in Yoruba at this point. You're, you're better than me. <laughs> Great, so like, uh, like Asha said, my name is Dara. Like many of you, I am a designer and engineer, but I think more truthfully, I really enjoy building things and I absolutely love supporting people who build things. Um, I was born in a, oh, this is still this. Um, I was born in a not so small city in, on the uh, southwestern coast of Nigeria called Lagos, Niger uh, called Lagos. It is home to about 22 million people, so it is Nigeria's largest city, it is Africa's largest city, and just generally, it's one of the world's largest cities. Um, so this is me, Dara, many, many years ago in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, and at a pretty young age, my family and I, we relocated to Austin, Texas. And so similar to many of you, uh, I think if you are a first generation person or you are currently living in somewhere, somewhere that may be different from where you previously called home, you can probably relate to how I felt which was uh, navigating this balance of uh, my very Nigerian uh, experience at home, but then also my very Texan upbringing, right? And so, you know, I was very Yoruba at home, and then I was also very Texan, right? And so from a pretty early age, I had this fascination with cross-cultural exchange and this idea of uh, us moving closer to becoming a global village. And I think for the most part, that's why I got into technology. And we're closer than we've ever been before. So we now have 4.4 billion people online, which means most of the world, technically, is now online. And so I'm sure you're probably wondering where these people are coming from. So let's take a look. So this map here um, represents, so the darker the country, that means in pure numbers alone, the more people online there. And so let's look at the US, which is, uh, raise your hand if you're here from the US. Okay, so half the room. Raise your, hair, raise your hand if you're here from somewhere in Europe. Okay, also half the room. Okay, now raise your hand, and I'm going to be, uh, there might be some overlap here. Raise your hand if you are from or uh, you are currently based in somewhere in Central or South America. Okay, a few folks. Hey, guys. Um, raise your hand if that relates to you, but Australia. Okay, we, next, time, next year. Next year, we'll, we'll do this. Um, okay, raise your hand if somewhere on the Asian continent. Okay, great, awesome. And then, of course, last but not least, uh, raise your hand if you are from Africa. Woo! I, I paid the, them to be here and say that. Um, so let's look at the United States, right? So the United States has 300 million internet users, um, but more interestingly, 95% uh, internet penetration. That means most people are already online. So if you're building products and trying to figure out where your next available customers are going to come from, it's likely not going to be from the US. It's probably going to be from, for the most part, anywhere else in the world. So if we look at in the past year alone, so this is data from January 1st, 2018 to December 2018. So in India, we had 97 million new users come online. In Tanzania, we had a 173% increase, right? And so this is pretty standard for what you see in markets I work in, which is, uh, for the most part, Africa. 
So I've been thinking about these trends for a while. A few years ago, I was sitting at my desk in Seattle at the time I was at Microsoft working on Windows, and we had this concept of building for billions, right? But I felt that there was a little bit of a disconnect between the billions I was supposed to be building for um, and my understanding or my worldview, my understanding of their lived experience. So I had this question, how do we build products that are relevant and adaptive to different markets? And in the way that I'm sure many of you answer questions that linger in your mind and keep you up at night, I decided to put in my notice at work, leave my job, uh, sell all my things, pack my bags, and I was on a one-way flight to Nigeria. So, I, I mean, it's maybe a little bit drastic, but to me it felt like a, the most appropriate way to answer this question. And so I was on this journey, um, and I started uh, working with startups in different parts of the continent. So I've had the opportunity to live in Nigeria, in Senegal, in South Africa, and really learn from startups, founders, and ecosystem builders as many of you guys know, there has been tremendous growth in the startup and tech ecosystem across the continent, um, and then also in just emerging markets in general. And so I've been fortunate to learn a lot. Um, but I think even more importantly for me, I've been able to develop some, uh, w somewhat of a framework about how I build products. And so these are some of my guiding principles, which I would love to share with you guys today. First is context, and I think we already know um, a bunch about context, but this is really about stepping outside of ourselves and starting to um, avoid the innate bias that we have to design for ourselves and starting to think about um, the users that we're uh, designing for, especially if their experiences are very different than ours. So I have a pretty simple way um, I do this. It's literally playing connect the dots, except with people and markets. And so first I look for similarities, right? And so that's easy. Similarities could be language, could be culture, it could be infrastructure, it could be socioeconomic status, it could be how people shop, where they shop, what kind of content they, they consume, what kind of music they like. Um, and then we go and we identify the differences. So this photo here is a, a place in Cape Town. So it's actually outside of Cape Town. It's a township called Kailicha. So if you're imagining a township and you're thinking about a neighborhood, think much bigger. Kailicha is home to about 700,000 people. And so this is kind of at the like, base of the lookout point um, in the township. Uh, and it, is, it serves as a tech hub for entrepreneurs, but it is also the gaming center for the community. And so if we're looking for similarities, and we know that this is a gaming center in Kailicha, one thing that we'll observe is that, OK, people are gaming and come to find out that they're gaming a ton. But then if we look for differences, what we'll see is that people are, for the most part, if they're playing games, they're playing them here. Why? Because uh, to play a game, you need a, uh, you need a gaming device, which is probably expensive. You need a high-powered, um, or maybe you'll need a high-powered computer, which is probably expensive as well. Um, and then you'll need super fast internet to compete, which is also probably expensive, right? And so how can we start reimagining, if we're designing a game or we're designing consoles, how can we start reimagining how we design when we know that there are users who are, uh, whether it's paying by hour or not using personal devices to game? And one of the things I've noticed is that a lot of the things I'll find, so maybe in Senegal I'll experience something, and then the same thing or the same context is shared in like Bangladesh. So if you start looking up gaming centers, you're not going to find gaming centers in London or LA. Not that they don't exist, right? But they serve a different purpose, right? And so this goes to show just how significant gaming centers are in different and similar uh, markets in, around the world. So once you start looking and understanding context, what you'll likely find are some constraints. So for many of us, this is our lived experiences. So we're always connected, right, between our laptops and our smartphones, our super high-end smartphones, um, and then our Wi-Fi, our blazing fast, fancy tech startup Wi-Fi, and our home Wi-Fi and our 4G LTE. This is our reality. But that 4.4 billion I told you guys about, this is, for the most part, their reality. So if you go to Lagos, uh, first you'll notice that most people have two phones. Um, one of the phones is probably a simple feature phone. And that phone is connected to whoever has the best calling or texting plan. 
The second phone is probably a lower end Android phone. Um, and this is connected to whoever has the best data plan. And then how many of you guys know what this third picture represents? Okay, awesome, okay, awesome. Um, so this is a USSD code, and this is how people buy data. And so most of the world buys data on a prepaid basis. So maybe you'll buy 250 megabytes this week, next week you'll buy a gig. Um, and a gig means a lot of different things uh, in different places, and it's also the cost varies a ton. And so the price of a gig, sometimes, depending on where you are, a gig, can, a give a, a gig of data can cost up to 20% of your monthly income. Please raise your hand if you're willing to uh, spend 20% of your salary on one gigabyte of data. Okay, we have one, <laughs> we have one person who is willing. Uh, ask him for money for other things. because, um, And so I, I am not willing to spend 20% of my monthly income on a gig of data, right? And so what I've found everywhere I've been is that people are constantly turning their cellular data on and off during the course of a day. So when they're actively using their phones, their cellular data is on. When they're not, it's off. So every day you're making the considerations of speed, bandwidth, storage, and data costs. It means, uh, is it really important for me to watch this person's Instagram story or Maybe I should turn my WhatsApp automatic downloads off, or how many pictures of my family do I need to delete just to download a 40 megabyte app? Or even, man, how many times does this company have to update their app with bug fixes, and now I have to reinstall it? Um, so these are the daily considerations that people are making when they're data conscious. So I wanted to illustrate this with a product that we're all really familiar with, um, because I think they did a really phenomenal job on, in building an experience that's accessible to people in lower connectivity or using more basic Android phones. So the Uber Lite app was created by the Uber India team and expanded to different emerging markets. And the first thing that you'll notice is that the app is just five megabytes. So for context, the Uber app that many of you have on your phones, especially if you're using Android, is about 45 megabytes, right? So this is a huge difference. So how did they do, it? How did they do this? So like George mentioned, it obviously uh, required a ton of cross-team collab or cross-discipline collaboration. But on the design side, they removed a lot of the heavier design elements. And they also decided to use the native Android font. I know there is a brand designer in the room that's just cringing at the thought of using a native font in their UI, right? But for the end user, right, this, this served a benefit because they had a lighter weight app. Another thing they did, they did was they ditched the map interface. And so many of us are used to Uber's design language. You load your app and you see this map. Right, and you understand that. But what they found was that many people were using older phones with inaccurate GPS chips. And so the map served absolutely no purpose and it meant people couldn't book rides. And so they ditched the map and they focused more on user intent. And now the maps are available on tap. So if you need it, you can opt into it. And if you don't, you can opt out. And this one was really interesting to me, right? So I think many of us take for granted how familiar we are with our input methods. So we spend all day typing on our keyboards or typing on our phones. And we, didn't, we don't realize that this uh, typing that we're doing is something that for many people is seen as complex, right? And so they reduced a lot of complexity by prioritizing tap over type. So essentially, they prioritize the tappable UI. So someone could, in theory, book a, book a ride by just tapping through, right? So without ever having to type. So if you're here in the room and you're saying, hey, Dara, this is great, but we do not have the resources to build an entirely new app. I understand, right? I, I think there are small wins uh, that we can all uh, try to do to empower our users who may be data conscious, right? So for instance, Headspace lets me know how many megabytes before I download a meditation. Or the Spotify team just released a really cool um, standalone version of their product that lets you know or lets you set an upper limit on the mobile data that you want to use. Or Google Maps, this is my favorite feature. Well, first, I, I just love Google Maps, but this is my favorite feature they've come out with where you can download your map offline or download your map so you can use it offline. So whether if I'm hiking in Seattle or if I'm in a low connectivity space in Lagos, I'm able to access this map. And they also let you know how much storage on your device it's going to take, the very, very thoughtful things. 
So many of you might be saying, okay, you're telling me about these other markets, you're telling me about the constraints. Honestly, I just don't, I'm not trying to build for this, right? I want to encourage us that I think some of the most creative solutions are born out of constraints. Sending money should be as easy as sending a text message. I've been seeing this sentiment a ton, especially with the recent announcement of Facebook's Libra, right? So tech journalists have been saying that we should be able to send money like we send text messages, right? And so I think for many people, especially those in Africa and Asia, they're reading these articles and are like, hey guys, we've been sending money like text messages for a really long time. And so I wanna introduce you guys to mobile money, right? Mobile money is used by almost one billion people around the world, and it is less Venmo and more like entire financial infrastructure built on top of mobile. So in PESA, I think by many accounts, really ushered us into this mobile money revolution. Um, it's a product based in Kenya um, that is, it sits under a telecom. So if you were in Kenya, maybe, a decade ago before M-Pesa and you wanted to send money to someone upstate or up country, you would probably find someone you trusted and have them like a taxi driver that you really like or your uncle and have them go and deliver that money, right? So that's the way people had to, uh, I guess that was their own financial system because they were excluded from the banking system. And so what M-Pesa did was it literally made a, uh, financial services accessible to everyone. It was super inclusive. So M-Pesa works on literally any device. So whether you have a, raise your hand if you had a Nokia brick phone. Amazing, you guys understand. So if you still have that phone, you can use M-Pesa, right? You can use M-Pesa on your iPhone, you can use M-Pesa if you're offline, you can use M-Pesa if you're connected. It's also designed for SMS. So the menus, the core interactions are all done with an SMS. And so this means that if I want to send you um, some money, all I have to do is put in your mobile number and how much I want to send you and send the text. And now you have money. And so they're doing like 200 million plus transactions via SMS every month. And then last but not least, I think this is the most important. So before in PESA, so we've talked about context and constraints and before in PESA, 80% of Kenyans were underbanked, so they were excluded from the banking system. And so now with M-Pesa, you can make bill payments, you can pay for groceries, um, you can get loans, you can get insurance products with your mobile number. Talk about creativity, right? And so I've just shared with you guys three things that are my, I think, daily go-tos. Um, now, whether I'm thinking about products in the US market or in Senegal or in Nigeria, um, and so I hope that these are able to help you, but they are no, by no means the end-all be-all to unlocking global expansion. And so I say, when in doubt, ask, right? And so whether this means taking a trip to a market that you guys are exploring, launching into, or just building a stronger uh, feedback loop um, with your global users, when in doubt, literally ask. Um, thank you guys, and let's keep the conversation going.